Oh hi, I'm the heretic. So a video by Azure Scapegoat was brought to my attention. He wants to make the case for a planned economy. A planned economy is when what is produced, where, when, and how much is determined by a centralized authority, typically a feature of societies under authoritarian governments. But does this concept have merit? Is there a benefit to having economic decision-making controlled by the government? If so, how much, and how is this accomplished? We'll be exploring that argument and its merit in this counter-narrative to Azure Scapegoat. His original video will be in the description. Let's begin. He begins by talking about a post-scarcity economy. Specifically, how do we do it? Is it even possible to achieve? Azure defines post-scarcity as a point in which every person has access to the goods and services they need to live comfortably. He argues that we already have a post-scarcity economy. Our capacity for production can already supply everyone on Earth with what they need for a comfortable life. But this begs the question, what is a comfortable life? How does Azure define a comfortable life, and does that standard apply to everyone universally? Comfortable life is most likely referring to a sense of physical and psychological ease persistent over the course of someone's lifetime. So that's the definition I'm going to assume Azure is using. Let's further assume that these goods will be provided at no cost to the consumer. But what goods and services do we need, specifically? I have my own preferences for food, drink, entertainment, and shelter. You, dear viewer, will have your own preferences, as will everyone we've ever met. The standard for a comfortable life is therefore subjective. Azure might be able to define his comfortable life, but to apply a universal standard based on subjective preference is irrational and can only be done through a totalitarian authority. It is not even a possible standard to achieve either, since desires are infinite while access to them is finite. As William Shakespeare noted in Troilus and Cressida, that the will is infinite and the execution confined, that the desire is boundless and the act a slave to limit. When production meets everyone's preferences, we'll want for more. Production will necessarily have to increase because our standard for what a comfortable life is for us will necessarily increase, production will have to rise to meet it, on top of meeting the demands for an expanding population. People's preferences are furthermore ever-changing, our wants and needs evolving over our lifetimes. The productivity of such an economy in order to meet everyone's desires must expand exponentially. One need only look at a demand curve to see that, as the commodity of a price approaches zero, the number of units desired approaches infinity. Going by the standard of a comfortable life being provided at zero cost, being post-scarcity, a post-scarcity economy must have infinite resources. Oh, scratch that. Infinite production. As explained in my video on the worker-die dichotomy, even if we had infinite resources, we can only utilize a finite amount of it at any one time, making mean infinite demand impossible. Post-scarcity is impossible, even ignoring the laws of physics. As Azure will admit later, there is not infinite energy or matter, let alone infinite production. Now you might be thinking that I am conflating want with need. Well, why not? Comfort is not a prerequisite for survival. We don't need it, per se, but it's desirable. Therefore, if we're looking to give everyone a comfortable life, a comfortable life is a question of want. As I explained previously, people's wants will expand. If you don't believe me, think about what you want for a comfortable life. Food, water, clothes, shelter. And in addition to that, you're probably thinking of computer and internet access, video games, and other stuff to keep you entertained. Now realize that some of the things you need for a comfortable life did not exist 100 years ago. Plus, some of the food you have in mind is probably processed, 
as are the clothes and your choice of shelter. And you can be sure your computers and video games did not exist. What did people need to live comfortably in the year 919? What people need changes over time and will likely continue to change as new goods and services come into being. Speaking for myself, I want to live on a gas giant sized spaceship, but my desires are tempered by my inability to have hundreds of thousands of planets worth of raw materials slapped together to make something that would tear apart the Death Star with tidal forces alone. At our present level of preference and consumption, can we meet the preferences of most people on Earth? Should more of the world industrialize to a Western standard of technological development, then meeting the demands should be trivial. However, we must temper our desires to the material reality of our finite universe. Don't get me wrong, wanting everyone to live comfortably is a laudable goal. Can it be an ideal people strive for? Sure, but much like perfection, reaching it isn't possible. What's really going on here is that people are expected to hear the word comfortable life and immediately insert their own preferences into that definition. This manipulative language tricks people into making Azure's argument for him and causes them to regard counterarguments as attacks against their own preferences, like somehow, I want to ban all food. I don't, obviously, but that's what's going to be projected onto me. We're only 30 seconds in, and the premise has already fallen apart. A post-scarcity economy is impossible. But moving on. Azure states overproduction is a result of producing for profit rather than need. Firstly, define profit. I know it sounds silly, I know. But profit has become a buzzword that Marxists are desperately trying to politicize. Profit should be what happens when revenue minus expense equals a positive number. But in a video by non-compete I replied to, his definition of profit was completely different. It being the difference between the value of the worker's productivity minus the wage that's being paid, with no regard for the firm's revenue, consumers, or how revenue is generated in the first place. Since Marxists are wont to redefine words as an obvious obfuscation tactic, I need to pin down these definitions. Finding your terms is very important. When you're explaining that waste is a result of production for profit, I, I don't know what that word means. You have to tell me. Otherwise, I have no way of evaluating the truth of your claim. But anyways, we have to move on again. One minute in, and he gives his thesis statement that a rationally and democratically planned economy can give everyone what they need. Well, we'll look at his arguments and see if his thesis has merit. Well, first, he cites statistics about how capitalism is responsible for 20 million deaths annually. He doesn't expressly say it, but he deliberately chose to put it in the picture in his video. So unless presented evidence that he was putting it in ironically, I must assume he agrees with it. Well, I debunked these statistics and more previously in a video reply I did to Democratic Socialist 01. Put simply, the statistics counts actions by government, as well as failure to act, as something that can be attributed to capitalism, as though inaction is equal to murder. Even though inaction is, by definition, passive, there are an infinite number of things you are not doing right now. It would be impossible for you to justify your inaction for all of them. In form, it's no different than being asked to prove that you didn't punch me in the face just one second ago. So this standard, that capitalism, whatever that means, is responsible for the deaths of millions through inaction is ludicrous. Nor can you attribute government action to capitalism, unless you argue that all governments are capitalist. Given that you haven't defined capitalism, it's left ambiguous. Once again, we're left assuming. Also, 120,000 deaths due to austerity? Austerity is a government program, so if anything, you should be making an argument about democide here. Now, I'm not here to defend capitalism. I might have in the past, but as Esso the Free pointed out, capitalism is a meaningless political term 
that is just an impediment to discussion. Most of us agree that voluntary cooperation and voluntary association is universally preferable to coercion by a centralized, omnipotent authority. Most of us. But that's where I stand. Now, Azure conflates the philosophy of laissez-faire free markets to neoliberalism. Given his chronic failure to define his terms, and neoliberalism being attributed to literally everything, from libertarianism to communism, I cannot properly critique this claim one way or another. But the claim that the West is trending towards increased market freedom is falsifiable with even the slightest examination. No moves are being made to free the monopoly on credit Western governments hold through central banks. Internet freedom is constantly under attack through net neutrality in the US and Article 13 in Europe, pushing towards increased centralization and control through the government. Commodities the government doesn't like are being banned, such as bump stocks in the US, semi-automatic weapons in New Zealand, pornography in the UK, and let's not even get into Trump's tariffs in the US. Where this claim to increasing economic or even personal freedom comes from, I don't know. But at least later on, he defines what capitalism is. According to him, capitalism is allowing anyone with sufficient capital to make whatever business they want. I mean, it's not a great definition, but it would have been nice to hear that definition earlier when you were attributing democide to capitalism. If it's just people with capital starting businesses, how can they possibly be held responsible for things like malaria or people dying from curable diseases? If people can be held responsible for things they might have otherwise been able to prevent, then I should be able to hold Azure responsible for malaria and other curable diseases as well, as well as every murder ever committed that he might have been able to prevent, but failed to do so because of whatever reason, like geographical distance. Now here, Azure is doing a little stick figure drawing, someone trying to start a seal clubbing business a clear reducio ad absurdum that falls apart very quickly with even basic cross-examination. Azure just assumes that a business would make revenue. It's a common thing for critics of markets to assume that revenue is something a business just gets automatically as a condition for being in business. Even though in order for a seal clubbing business to even be considered profitable, we have to ask, who are the seal clubbers customers? What value do these customers expect to get from having this guy club seals on their behalf? Because fundamentally, all businesses are at the mercy of their customers. Things like location, demographics, proximity, marketing, prices, even simple customer whims, and so much more all factor in as to whether or not customers will patronize an establishment. So the claim that businesses don't need to worry about how the rest of society is doing is false. After all, they have to know if they want to make money. Do businesses have to care if what they're producing is necessary? Of course they do. How else are they going to attract customers? Customers who are completely ignored in this analysis as to how economic firms receive revenue. Now it's worth reminding you, dear viewers, that Azure wants to have a centrally planned economy that is controlled democratically. Somehow, the people can be trusted to make decisions for a firm in a democratic election, but they can't be trusted to make choices from a firm and for themselves as individuals. But here's the thing. The only economic firm with a guaranteed revenue stream is a state, since people are not free to disassociate from it. Now, Azure's scapegoat changes his definition of capitalism calling it free markets and private ownership. He never mentioned this when he said capitalism is people with capital forming businesses. His previous definition made no distinction between a private individual using capital he legitimately acquired or a ruler using resources stolen from their legitimate owners through taxation as capital. Remember what I said earlier about capitalism being a meaningless political term? What's happening here is called equivocation. He is changing the definition according to whatever narrative he wants to use right now. Next, he tries to argue that businesses and governments, note the conflation here, 
need to expand infinitely, but he fails to explain why. I've elaborated previously that government spending operates on an exponential growth curve that escalates as the population increases and over time. But businesses? Well, once again, Azure is only looking at one half of the equation, not realizing that businesses don't necessarily need to increase production to increase revenue. Technological innovation can create new resources or find new ways to use resources that already exist in such a way that reduces industrial inputs and decreases waste. Even ignoring this, increased production means we can meet the needs of a larger and growing population. Isn't that a good thing for achieving post-scarcity? Perhaps it would help if I explained one of the key differences between businesses and government. Businesses produce resources. Governments produce nothing on their own and must steal resources produced privately. His next claim is that outsourcing was a direct result of a backlash to unionization. The main driver for outsourcing is and always has been domestic labor becoming so expensive due to labor restrictions socialists advocate for. Large economic restrictions and taxation at every level of production making goods and services too expensive for consumers to be willing to buy. In other words, Azure just admitted that outsourcing occurred as a direct consequence to his own ideas, which I'm glad we're on the same page on. Next up, Azure conflates businesses and governments as one in the same while ignoring businesses' capacity to invent new resources. We've already covered that. Moving on. Now, he finally gets to the juicy bits, describing a planned economy, stating that every village or community will democratically decide on how to utilize resources, believing that the results of these elections will necessarily be for the well-being of the people. Though this is the second time he talks about this without going into detail. How will these elections function? What incentives are in place to make sure that such elections will be rational? How did these incentives come about? How do you know that people will always vote based on what's best for everyone instead of what's best for themselves when such things are in conflict. Even if they aren't, how can you be sure the results will always be correct? Or if they are incorrect, what safeguards such a society from disaster? How does one democratically plan an economy anyhow? Do people vote on whether to produce, say, 500 units versus 300 units? How do we determine what is up for a vote and what isn't? Is it by consensus, majority rule, or parliamentary pluralities? Do people vote for representatives, or is this a direct democracy? How are the decisions of a democratic vote enforced? These are very important questions we need to answer before we can consider voting to be a preferable means of determining optimal economic output, all of which are just glossed over as, once again, we're moving on. Next, he defends historical examples of planned economies by stating that the Soviet Union didn't have unemployment or homelessness, which is factually untrue. We can agree unemployment means involuntary idleness for the sake of discussion. As detailed in a 1992 study by William Moskov on unemployment in the Soviet Union, well, to summarize, they did. Particularly during the Stalin era, they had the opposite problem as well of shortages of specialized jobs such as doctors and non-industrial engineers. To say nothing of how totalitarian societies are notorious for their dubious record-keeping and fudging their own numbers. So whether this is altered to make the Soviet Union look better than it was, since the author was using Soviet sources, I couldn't say, but it's worth remarking on. Also, it's worth noting how Azure fetishizes full employment. The truth is that we can have full employment in the world tomorrow. Just pay everyone who's unemployed a dollar a day to dig a hole and then fill it up again. Sure, paying every unemployed person in the world a dollar a day would be expensive, but it's doable. You can see the problem right away, in that nothing is being produced. No production is occurring, or as Azure would say, no need is being met for society. Our goal should be to produce as much as we can with the least amount of effort. Full production, as it were. 
we can have full production without full employment. And as I demonstrated earlier, we can also have full employment without full production. Simply full employment doesn't mean needs are being met. Azure's fetishization of full employment contradicts his earlier statement when he said that it's desirable to have fewer people in factories so they can do other things. He agreed with full employment not necessarily being desirable and until he didn't. And no, the Soviet Union did not provide free healthcare or education. People were still required to pay for it. It was just paid for with money stolen through taxation. Now, Azure condemns GDP as a measurement of economic success in a country. So it's quite hypocritical of him to cite GDP as an example of how Soviet totalitarianism was superior economically to the free market economy of Russia, which isn't free market at all. Their economic freedom score has been consistently below the world average since 1995, which is as far back as the data goes, with failings in their respect for property rights, government integrity, that is to say lack of corruption, as well as below average monetary and financial freedom. I mean, they aren't Cuba, but to call Russia a shining example of economic liberty is, once again, factually untrue. The collapse of the Soviet Union had nothing to do with an arbitrary change of heart on the part of Soviet leadership and everything to do with the economic vulnerabilities, inconsistencies, and economic distortions that a planned economy brings about. Now, Azure's citation for how the 1991 elections that are attributed to ending the Soviet Union's were rigged is a poll about how people are nostalgic for the Soviet Union, which offers no proof of election fraud, simply that people disagreed with the results years later, much like Azure. I guess he's all for democracy until it's a result he doesn't like. I wonder how he feels about Brexit, and if there should be a second referendum. Hmm... Now he's going to try to debunk the economic calculation problem. For those of you who don't know, the economic calculation problem was proposed by Mises to explain why a planned economy will fail, that it is impossible for bureaucrats to have all the information needed to make these economic decisions. But his rebuttal? It's 2019! Joking aside, he special pleads that a sufficiently sophisticated computer can make economic calculations better than bureaucrats can, with the implicit assumption that it can make decisions better than millions of consumers and producers can in a market. Which, in a way, makes sense. The way Mises originally proposed the economic calculation problem was an appeal to complexity, beyond the ability of any one person to have these decisions made accurately. A computer wouldn't have these limitations, and even if it did, all that would be needed is to give it more processing power. This isn't dissimilar to how the Soviets thought that if they had a magic mathematical formula, they could predict the cost of everything and make economic planning decisions perfectly. This magic formula turned out to be the Sears catalog, but nevertheless, what is a computer algorithm besides a mathematical formula, albeit a really complex one? But in theory, with the right inputs, you could create a computer complex and sophisticated enough to cut through the complexity of an economy without the need for markets or prices. But the economic calculation problem is not about complexity. It demonstrates that under a moneyless, marketless system of central planning, getting the information necessary is literally impossible. Let's break the economic calculation problem down. One. Under free markets, prices are assigned to goods and services in competitive markets. These prices give producers the signal as to which goods are most needed and consumers which goods are most valuable. 2. A planned economy cannot have markets making calculations. And because there are no markets, there are no supply and demand curves. After all, you cannot exchange with yourself. 3. A planned economy must abolish money for the same reason. 4. The only way to calculate economic and social need is through units, measuring an average amount of labor time, such as one man hour. 5. Such labor units would be functionally identical to money and cannot exist outside of a marketplace. 6. 
The only way for a planned economy to defeat the economic calculation problem is to cease to be a planned economy. It doesn't matter how sophisticated your computer is. It could be a TI-82. It could be a matryoshka brain, a megastructure in which the entirety of a star's energy output is devoted to powering an unbelievably powerful computer. This computer is being asked to accomplish something that is not possible because the inputs it requires can only exist in the absence of a planned economy. You haven't solved anything by replacing Stalin's Sears catalog with IBM's Watson. Your magical computer is being asked to do the impossible. Create actual infinite production for a theoretically infinite number of people in a finite universe using an economic model whose inputs necessarily for functioning require abandonment of the economic model in the first place. It's not possible. End of story. But I still have more questions. Which of the two definitions that you provided is your definition of capitalism? How do you know, for certain, that the sole motivation of business owners is for profit? How do you even define profit? Why do you conflate business with government so often? How do we know a democratically planned economy will necessarily benefit mankind? How can you have an economy planned by a matryoshka brain also be democratic? How does it make sense that millions of people can be trusted to democratically plan an economy, but those same people can't be trusted to make decisions for themselves? Do you have any other ways to get around the economic calculation problem? Sadly, we'll have to wait because this video is running very long as it is, and I'm only halfway through Azure Scapegoat's video, so we'll have to wait. Until next time, don't worry, there will definitely be a part two. Stay tuned and stay heretical.